Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Dr. K Show. I'm so excited to have you with us today. Um, I actually have uh, a guest with me today that I'm very excited about. Her name is Nikki Robertson. I heard of her through another podcast that I was listening to about triathlon and sports nutrition. And I thought, oh, you know what would be a really cool thing would be to have Nikki on my podcast sometime. And here we are. Um, we're going to be talking today about heart disease and protein. Um, and kind of dem demystifying some of those myths that uh, you usually hear about, well, heart disease in general and, and breaking all of that down. So a little bit about Nikki. Nikki Robertson is the founder of Reinvent Health and author of Demystifying Nutrition and Nutrition Rx. Nikki started work her working life in publishing brand management, advertising, and development of online educational content in the late 1990s as one of the industry's earliest developers of online educational content. She then went on to establish Origin Media before changing career paths in 2006. Nikki is a clinical nutritionist trained, trained in functional nutrition, uh, master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming and psychoneuroimmunology, which sounds so cool. <laughs> she consults to a number of multinational companies regarding staff wellness, work-life balance strategies, executive wellness coaching, and stress management while running Reinvent Health, a nutrition and wellness coaching practice in Joh Johannesburg. Uh, she is, a, I have never been there, but I really would love to visit sometime. Um, she is a regular guest on Radio 702, resident nutritionist on DSTV's Real Health, and is the producer and presenter of the Reinvent Health podcast. Her current focus is creating content for television broadcast and online educational material. Awesome. Well, welcome. I'm so excited to have you with us, Nikki. Tell me a little bit about how you got into nutrition and um, this whole this whole thing that you do now. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me as a guest. Yeah. It's always so good to to uh, sometimes be on the other side of, yeah, I'm always asking questions. So um, yes. it's quite cool to be on the other side of a microphone for a change. <laughs> um, so yeah, I got into nutrition after many, many years of battling with weight and battling with my health my entire life. As a, as a teenager, I was very active. I was a competitive figure skater. I was a professional dancer as a kid. And, um, you know, as in those sort of sports, you have very distorted body image. It's, it goes with the territory. So, but nobody in those days also taught us how to eat right. We didn't know. We, we thought in those days, you eat lots of sugar to give you energy. And we had no idea that sleep was so critical to, to the whole process. Um, you know, you woke up in the morning, you had cereal for breakfast and you expected your body to perform. And eventually when you hit puberty, that's when things really start going wrong. So eventually I, went, I was in my early twenties, in fact, even earlier. And I'd, I'd put on, you know, so much weight over my lifetime. I'd gone from, I think I'm trying to convert it into pounds or so 45 kilos is about 90 odd pounds. And I used to double that and then go back to under a hundred pounds and I could do this trick at any given time, um, literally by starving myself, by, by binge, diet, binge eating and dieting and trying all sorts of, of strange starvation diets. And eventually what happened was it stopped working. So like many people can relate, you know, you can lose weight or gain weight and then something gives and your body stops responding, but you also get sick. Yeah. So um, tummy issues, gut issues, headaches, mood issues, um, and my thyroid stopped. So I went to a doctor, had my thyroid checked. I was diagnosed with um, hypothyroid, with um, sort of insulin resistance, all the usual, um, typical, what we see every day in, 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 in a clinical practice. Right. And I, even the doctors couldn't, and even nowadays, most doctors, yourself excluded, but many doctors aren't trained in nutrition. They aren't trained in preventative health. They're trained to give you metformin, if you are if you are a diabetic and altruxin or whatever it is when you have a thyroid issue and appropriately so, but they don't say, well, I'm giving you this for six months, but you've got to you've got to sort yourself out. 
Um, so eventually I found a doctor who said that to me and it was the last thing I wanted to hear because I was convinced there was a magic pill and I was convinced there was like a diet pill that he could give me that would make it all go away and there wasn't of course there never will be because we've got to change the way the, the messages that's coming in through the food we eat and what it's communicating into our bodies and our metabolisms and you know I don't think anybody who has a weight problem problem is entirely to blame you know people oh, blame themselves yeah. mm -hmm. that we call it you know we don't have self-control we um <laughs> yes. you know, eat too much it's it's always a it's a lack of something on the person's behalf but it's not always the, the case i mean the way food has been manufactured and processed is designed so that we eat more um it's designed to skew the messages in the endocrine system so that we store fat and we don't use it for energy so and i don't think any food company went out there purposely trying to do this they went out there trying to make money and they found the best way to do that was to get people to drink more and eat more but if we know this now and we know how it works then we can do something about it so it's it's been quite an interesting journey Oh, it's such an interesting journey. Um, but it's such a common journey. I think, you know, there's so many people that come into my office with the, you know, they, they've been on level thyroxine, a hypothyroid, uh, so, um, medication for 10, 15, 20 years, you know, and they're, and they're so frustrated because they're 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight and they can't, the, the weight watchers and the dieting isn't working anymore. And, and they just don't know what to do. And, and it's always so frustrating because there's so much that could have been done so long ago before the thyroid just was completely practically dependent on, on the yep. med. And um, yeah, so it's always, a, it's always interesting. But I've, I've found that so much of hormone balance goes back to the GI tract and, and so many other areas as well as nutrition. Um, that, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's a journey for sure. Um, awesome. So when talking about protein and, and heart disease, uh, I just wanted to start right off the bat. One of the questions that, that I get asked all the time when I say, Hey, I really would like you to start eating more protein is I get this, this kind of kickback of, well, I'm like really worried about my cholesterol and about heart disease. Um, do you want to just start us off with kind of a basics of, of why first off, maybe protein is really important. So I'm, I'm utterly passionate about the fact that we don't eat enough protein. And I know this yeah. because <laughs> I've been through it. Yes. Um, it's, it's like you've got the secret sitting here and you're not taking it, you're not using it and it's widely available and it's, it's going to solve the problem. And people go, well, I think it's because it's a perception that protein is just red meat and that's not the case. There's so many forms of protein. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about plant protein. I personally don't believe that plants will give you protein or the right balance of amino acids. <laughs> I don't, I don't buy it. And the reason I don't buy it is because I was vegan before it was popular to be vegan. When I was yeah. in my, um, so when I was 17, 18 years old, I, I decided vegetarianism and then veganism might solve my problems. Mm. And it was possibly the worst thing I could have done. Um, eventually I just, I saw a piece of raw meat at a party and I ate it because my body was saying, you need this. Wow. And after I, I instantly felt better I felt different my, my brain came back because there was something in in this in the it was obviously the protein and when I went through my fat loss journey so um back in the early 2000s when I really learned how to burn body fat and I, I burnt or I, I managed to lose 30 15 percent of my body fat in 12 weeks wow. and what I did was eat I ate a lot of food and a good amount of that in every single meal was protein. Now, protein isn't just red meat. It's fish, which is full of your omega, omega-3s, yeah. um, chicken, eggs. There's so many forms of protein. So people do get stuck on this idea that red meat or protein affects heart disease. And this is something that was created, I don't know who, but I assume by the agricultural industry who are, you know, in, in the 40s, just past World War II, when um, uh, I think it was, 
carbohydrates or, or mass produced corn products. I think wheat mm-hmm. and corn was probably subsidized by most first world governments. That's when we started seeing this push towards um, governments and companies, industry promoting heart healthy foods, which were grains. And there was no scientific basis for that. We know that um, there's an economic basis for that. Um, the, the meat industry didn't have the, sub, the government subsidies that, that the agricultural or the, 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 the sort of the grain industry does. Right. And along with corn production comes liquid seed oils. And that is a huge moneymaker. And liquid seed oils are in everything. And they're hugely inflammatory. Now, it's, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s, there were television adverts telling us to get our polyunsaturated fats, we should be using canola oil, we should be eating margarine. And what we saw in parallel to all this, these fats are good for you, is an increase in heart disease. This didn't happen prior to the mass manufacture of liquid seed oils and liquid fructose, to be quite honest. And these are all derivatives of corn. And corn is one of the biggest agricultural money-making products worldwide. So it makes sense for governments and uh, food producers to push the the consumption of of liquid seed oils and liquid fructose, liquid sugars. And we have seen an increase in cancers, heart rate, diabetes, you name it. Every lifestyle preventable disease has spiked alongside our increased use of of these products. So when we go back to meat, what are cows typical factory farmed cows fed they're fed corn and, and their body fat <laughs> becomes yeah. these these poofers or these polyunsaturated fats that we should be avoiding avoiding if we want to avoid heart disease but we're getting this through these proteins or through these animal um byproducts so in order to avoid heart disease yeah you should be looking at grass-fed animals because they produce more saturated fat more omega-3 rich um, fats in their tissue which is good for us and good for our cardiovascular system but you know heart disease does not come from eating fats we know this now it does not come from eating protein comes from it's a it's a part of the basket of metabolic syndrome it's part of the basket of eating too much refined sugar and artificial liquid oils and this is the source of the problem and finally we're getting to a point and maybe it's because of there's a, so much information freely available now that and and science available to prove the point um you know just because our doctors weren't taught this and the dietitians the diet, people who study dietetics weren't taught doesn't mean it's not true right. it means that we've got to rethink the way we're doing things because of how what we've been doing now isn't working up until this point Yes. Oh man. I, I keep saying that too, just because if you, if you really look at like what's happening, especially in the United States with the um, medical association and just with our rates of heart disease and obesity, they are skyrocketing. Um, I saw a statistic the other day that um, I was watching a well, not to say that you should get all of your information from a documentary. However, I was watching a documentary and they said that um, I think our, the, Amer- the American Medical Association will potentially be bankrupt by like 2050, just simply because of the load of diabetes and heart disease on mm-hmm. our medical system, which is absurd. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it, that I think that gives a little bit of the weight of what has been done as far as the confusion around nutrition, um, simply because of how our governments um, have have uh, basically funded different types of research to push an agenda, <laughs> which is exactly. kind of crazy. Yeah, that's it. And let's call it what it is. If you if you're going out to prove a point um, and to obliterate every counter argument, I mean, I, you know, I think the best advice for most people is don't take studies too seriously or find out who funded the studies before you take them too seriously. Yeah. Um, anyone can call anything a study. You know, a group of 10 people is a study. Yep. It depends on whose agenda we're looking at. But mm-hmm. if we have to just put aside um, you know, what we hear, we see in documentaries or what we hear from our doctors or dietitians and just 
think about it. Our great grandparents did not suffer from the diseases we're seeing today because they didn't have these foods available to them that we have today. And that's if that's not a study, if that's not evidence enough, um, I don't know what is. And right. the thing is, we've become so indoctrinated. We think that we can't cook from scratch. Of course we can. We've just got to adjust <laughs> our, our brains into preparing, you know, understanding yes. that if we want to live long, healthy lives and not depend on medication, we've got to re think this thing and we've got to we've got to run our lives differently and not depend on um you know supermarkets and food producers to feed us there's a place for that but it's not what we designed to eat every day as a species right. and you know our biology is just not going to play ball with that that kind of thinking no matter how much we wish it would i know it mm-hmm. so if if um let's go into like kind of well Yeah, let's go into grass-fed finished beef. Let's talk about um, proteins that are, uh, or even if if people are able to hunt, you know, elk, bison, those wild meats where where um, animals are able to live and eat the way they are supposed to be. Um, What are some of the the other sides? So you mentioned if they eat grain, if they eat corn, um, that it can increase uh, on polyunsaturated fats, and which can be uh, inflammatory to the the body. What's Mm -hmm. the flip side? So if they are um, if they are eating what they're supposed to be. They, they actually have a lot of other health benefits um, yeah. beyond just, um, just uh, the fact that they're just, they have protein, right? So what, okay. what are some of those benefits? Okay. So we'll go actually go into the, the, the physical benefits of protein, but yeah. when a cow, for example, eats grass as it's supposed to do, and it will choose the pastures where there are herbs growing, where it needs certain nutrients and certain, um, so if, 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 a, if a farmland or a grass uh, a plain is grown in certain um, uh, soils and that, that animal requires certain minerals, it'll naturally be pulled towards you know, what it needs. It's more instinctive than say a human would be. Isn't that and, the coolest thing though? <laughs> It is. And if you put like a lump of salt down for cattle, they'll eat, some of them will go and lick the salt if they need it and some won't because they know if they, they know they're drawn to it. And we have this wisdom as well. We just forgot, forgot it somewhere. We, we depended on somebody else to tell us what we need, but it's simply not true. So when an animal ruminant um, consumes the food that it's supposed to, that it's been uh, designed to, to, to consume, it creates a different ratio of, of, of polyunsaturated to saturated fat within the meat, within its, its physical structure, within its musculature. Um, also what happens, interestingly, is that we think of plants as sources of polyphenols and phytonutrients. Yeah. But the meat also takes up a lot of those phytonutrients as well. So we're getting those polyphenols as well from meat that has been raised on grass. Now, when you are raising cattle and it's winter, there is absolutely no way that you can expect animals to survive through winter without being supplemented. So there is a place for some grain, some corn, but it shouldn't be the majority of that animal's diet. That is First and foremost, the majority should be what that ruminant, because they've got these big square teeth, they're designed to grind grass for most of the year. And that is, then you see the animal thrive. You see the shiny coat, you see the clear eyes, you see the wet nose, you don't see these poor unhappy animals. And yes, I know there's an ethical argument that's going to it's been going on since time immemorial it'll continue going on but this that's not really appropriate to this this um <laughs> this discussion at the moment that's a whole other story so this there's, there's the, the nutrition benefits um mm-hmm. from protein just from the by virtue of the fact that you're getting healthy fats and you're getting polyphenols from the plants that the animal's eating however If you get your protein intake correct, and by correct, I mean around about a gram per pound uh, of total body weight per day, which is probably three times more than the average person is getting in protein at the moment. So Mm -hmm. if you weigh 100 pounds, you could need 100 pounds, you need 100 grams of protein um, a day divided over, say, four meals, which will give you, say, 20 to 25 grams of protein per meal. That would be a kind of a big steak. You know, a, a yes. relatively large steak would be two chicken breasts. It would be six eggs in one meal. Not I that, know. You know <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> with, the yolk. Whole, with the yolk with the yolk the yolk is the the the, 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 the whole point of the egg the white okay. is just sort of the the the, the airbag around the real thing mm-hmm. um and and you know it's a lot of food and a lot of people aren't used to getting their heads around that that said most people won't think twice at eating four slices five slices of bread because there's no satiety with bread you know that's volume food we don't question that we know only too well what it's going to do to our body so what happens when you eat enough protein is what we're looking for is what we call a positive nitrogen balance so when you have a positive nitrogen balance in your blood in your system we become more insulin sensitive so our bodies are better adapt at handling the mechanism that takes glucose and puts it into the cells okay we also become more satiated so we get full faster so we tend to actually in fact eat less when we have the right amount of protein. Now, if you get your protein right, you can lose 100 grams of fat a day. That is, I've seen this across the board. We, um, in, in my nutrition practice, we measure body fat percentage, um, lean to, uh, to fat ratios. I'm sure you do as well. And we see 100 grams of fat loss per day if a person is consistent. So that is almost 250 gram power not pounds i'm trying to think metric and i'm trying to think oh, it's okay Sorry. it's okay <laughs> so it's it's a formidable amount of fat to lose it in is. a day just by eating more protein because your right. nitrogen balance is is where it should be and it's not for most people and in doing that you are regulating your insulin balance so the whole point of of fat loss and the reason why we end up obese or end up with a high uh, body fat percentage is because there's something going wrong or out of balance in the endocrine system, in the hormone system. It's simply messengers that have got the message wrong because there is too much, um, the the pancreas is producing too much insulin in response to the food we're eating. It's as simple as that. So the typical response is dieting. Most people go on a diet and they, they reduce and they feel miserable and they eat a lot of spinach and they think I can't live like this and they <laughs> give up the pleasures in life. And that is pointless because it's not sustainable. Right. So when we start thinking about nutrition as feeding the body what it needs to do its work um, and we focus on health, fat loss happens anyway. But we do have to get our heads around the fact that you need to eat a formidable amount of protein to get there. And it is there's there's no severe health implications. You would have to eat way in excess of a gram per pound to see any kind of adverse health, um, you know, adverse health, like a health problem. Um, I, I've never seen anyone have a, a problem eating too much protein from a, from a kidney point of view or a, a liver yeah. point of view. The other point is that if you want to detox, if you want your liver to actually work, phase two detoxification to work correctly, is you need to bind that toxin. It needs to become water soluble. And the only way to turn uh, toxins from being housed in little fat cells, because that's how the body safely holds on to toxins. So the more fat we have, the more toxic we are. But to yep. safely get rid of them, we need to make them water soluble. The only way to do that is to get an amino acid in there to turn that turn it water soluble. So a key component of detoxification is amino acids, which only come from protein you can't go and have a juice fast and expect to detox you're (laughs) going to feel miserable so that's where everything recycles back through the liver and you know it tells the body we're in crisis just hold on to these toxins hold on to the fat because there's nothing here to turn them water soluble so there's there's real biology and science to getting in adequate uh, amino acids it's it's huge yeah And on top of that too, I mean, protein in and of itself can be a, pr- a decent fiber source. And so if yep. you're on the topic of, of detoxification, you have to have enough fiber and you have to have a gut that's functioning well in order to be able to remove those toxins from the body. So if you're constipated, if you're not getting enough fiber, if you are you know, hand- handling any sort of issues that are going through the GI tract, um, that can increase your toxicity as well, because you're not like, it's amazing to me how much the body and the liver actually uses the GI tract as one of your detoxification ways of like getting stuff out of your body. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's like the super highway to like Crazy. fast track first line of defense is get it out of the gut and then we have to deal with the liver but you know and it is you do get fiber from 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 protein um i I just find it a little bit i don't know why where it went wrong everyone debates whether we should be on a keto diet or a high fat diet or a low carb diet no one talks about protein it's because i know 
we like the, the elephant is sitting in the room saying look at me I'm the key and we do nothing about it until you really start understanding how important it is it's so important for neurotransmitter production I mean if your neurotransmitters and your uh, and especially like your endorphins and things like serotonin and dopamine are primarily created in the gut if you have a GI imbalance there's no hope in hell that you're going to get this right without getting the protein right I mean your L-glutamine is one of your first most important supplements for getting that mucosal layer in, uh, intact in the yes. gut it's protein it's you know, protein it's, it's, it's protein <laughs> um, you know go out there and eat the damn stuff um and there's i mean there's whey protein there's so many ways of getting that protein down in really pleasurable ways we've just mm-hmm. got to I think we've got to get desperate. A person really has to be, have their back against the wall and feel hopeless before they start listening. Right. Um, anything right. that changes the brain. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's actually, you mentioned, so one gram of protein per um, kilogram yeah. of body weight or per, mm. well, yeah, I guess it does kind of work out one to one in pounds. Mm. Well, actually, wait. So there's one gram, sorry, I'm getting lost in between the I know. <laughs> I know what it is. Okay. So usually what they, what they have said, as far as what, um, Americans, I only know really what Americans should be eating, but I'm guessing it's fairly similar, um, elsewhere, but, um, usually what they, they say as far as, um, your average person. So not necessarily your athlete eating Mm -hmm. one gram or less per Mm -hmm. kilogram of body weight. So that actually would be, um, two grams per pound, two grams per pound. Right, right, Mm -hmm. right. Um, Mm -hmm. however, when I'm working with, and and I still think that we should be a little bit more on the higher side of that. Like, I really think we should be at about like a one-to-one. Um, Mm -hmm. and especially if we're dealing with anything like weight loss, as you mentioned, or if we're dealing with, um, athletes, then it Mm -hmm. kind of starts to tick up from there. Um, Mm -hmm. so, have you seen a benefit? Um, I mean, you just talked about a ton of the health benefits as far as um, protein for just everybody and why um, it's just one of those things that needs to not be left on the table. Um, but what about for athletes? Are there some benefits as far as protein goes? And then what are some of those, those levels that um, we should be shooting for as far as protein goes um, mm. when it comes mm. to that? So, so yeah, it, look, it depends on what kind of training they're doing yes, and what this is <laughs> so it, and i'm not going to talk bodybuilders because that's a whole other i mean mm. that goes into up to four or five grams per for per pound body weight right. um which again at those levels the people that i know of who eat that volume of protein don't get sick they don't have any adverse kidney problems the right. uric acid is normal the urea is normal and we test all the time to just like let's let's see let's see what happens right. so right. still at that level of protein intake um it doesn't seem but again it's individual so let's it not i don't want to generalize yeah you've really got to work with somebody who who gets a baseline and make sure that you're basically quite healthy before making any extreme changes um right. and then right. test fairly often if you do if you if there are any issues so uh, endurance athletes what i do is um if you're in a training phase i uh, balance out 30 30 30 so 30% protein 30% carbs 30% uh, fats and i get people to test and try different methodologies so a little bit more carb depending on the individual so if you're doing anything altitude related so if you're trail running up a mountain you need a little bit more fat a little bit more carb than you do protein yeah. um but and on training days it's different to event days and recovery days maybe a bit more on the protein So the protein we use for muscle recovery. So I want to go a little bit higher than the carb and the fat. And when I'm talking carb, I'm not talking flour-based or grain-based carbs, talking whole food, vegetable and fruit-based carbs. Um, But there is a place also for grains for athletes. And if you're looking at somebody with who's 25 years old with body fat and it's sort of in the teens, there's room to play with so much more choice Absolutely. compared to a 45 year old woman who has 45% body fat, who is trying to do their first 5k. You can't go carbo load or load up and train the same way that you would with an athlete who's doing, you know, a marathon, for example. So it is very, very personalized. It also comes down to that person's metabolic history. So have they always been active? have that do they have any other issues going on um, but really as a general rule I start off with equal amounts of everything 
And for most athletes, most, most athletes that I've worked with um, really eat badly. So they eat junk food. Yes. A lot of people think, you know, just because I'm training every day, it gives me a license to eat pizza every day. It's like, well, no, you're not just, would you put like diesel in your Ferrari and expect it to perform? It's like they do. Yeah. Yes. So any, that's the thing. So any healthy change is good. If you, if you start being conscious of making sure that your plate is full of everything that you need and all of that food is unprocessed and there's a range of, of, of fiber, of, of vegetables, of proteins and healthy fats, then already you're going to perform 150% better than you would having the KFC or the, or the pizza diet. So we start off there and then, then we do adjustments. So every, every couple of weeks, measure the, the, the biometrics, do blood, see how, how, how things are working. But you'll know as an athlete, you'll you'll know what's happening with your recovery. You'll know what's happening with, with your speed and your time and your strength. Interestingly, with a lot of athletes who are fairly advanced, who have been following a healthy diet, we need to put straight sugar into their diet to get them just that little bit more of an edge. And that comes down to, to muscle building as well. When we've added literally like a teaspoon of table sugar to somebody's recovery drink, the results yes. are profound. Yes. yes. So right. there's a place yeah. for everything. And then I found right. quite like amazing. It's like, there's a place for table sugar. There is, yes. there is for that particular person who, who, who was really, I mean, this is somebody who'd been training for 10 years and was a fairly elite athlete. They need that kind of glycogen. Yes. Um, and we are also looking at, at adjusting in micro increments. So when you're looking at general public and people trying to lose weight, the general principles is eat real food. Yeah. as little processed food as possible but when you're talking to athletes it's a lot more fine-tuned and it's really it's so individual there's no there's no one size fits all really um you know athletes often come to me and say well I want to be a keto adapted athlete I don't know if there's any such thing as that I think you know you can you can train your body to use fat but you cannot go and do an event without any kind of like sugar glycogen without any carbohydrate glycogen I don't think it's possible yeah. I think you've got to you've got to seriously consider your biology before getting crazy with those things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just off of of a caveat and maybe a, a side note, um, one of the things I learned about sports nutrition and especially how it affects the gut is that the Firmicutes bacteria they rise up in the gut, yep. especially when we're doing those ultra distances, those longer endurance events, and mm -hmm. they do that in response to cortisol, but also in response to sugar. But I think they play a role in in health helping athletes perform. There's a reason why they're there. Um, and so, and so it's just, it's part of the process, right? Like, I think we could always get as deep as we want, as far as physiology goes, but the average person isn't necessarily going to do that. So mm -hmm. I, um, I try to, to, to I, I always love to talk about the different things so that people know why they, they need to be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sugar, mm -hmm. Sugar for an athlete is an important thing. Carbohydrates are a good thing, um, but also the whole foods and the other on the flip side of training and using some of those different types of higher carbohydrate products help to yeah. balance out, you know, that full yeah. picture, which is why, Absolutely. yeah, which yeah. is why it's so important just to make sure that like the whole day of food is, yes is all balanced out <laughs> yes. Yes. yeah and yeah you know, it's not just what you do at the event or at the race or at, you know right. at, it's it's what you've done in the last six months that's yes. going to determine how you perform on the day yeah. uh, just like training your legs for a long run you've got to train your entire metabolism to use fuel efficiently yes so and build up those glycogen stores i mean there's so many pieces to it yeah yeah we yeah. don't want to go in under fueled <laughs> No, <laughs> and different, different, you know, circumstances are going to eat up that glycogen. I mean, I learned this the hard way a couple of weeks ago and mm. I did, I, I was doing a run and there was some stress and the stress ate up the glycogen. Like I, I just didn't see this coming. And right. I was like, it was such a, a, an amusing um, real life understanding of what goes on when you can't control for every variable. So that, that nutrition has to be the the bedrock of your nutrition needs to be right. Whether you are trying to lose weight, gain weight, or sort of perform in sport, you've got, it's a long game and all those points need to be better down before anything positive can happen. Right. 
Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's one other thing that I wanted to touch on with protein specifically, and that's mm -hmm. its benefit for the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. um, can you touch on that just a little bit? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the mitochondria is the energy house or the energy component of the cell. And to do that, we need glutathione, we need selenium, we need L-glutamine as well. We need a lot of components um, to get that mitochondria to, to work. And one of the most pivotal ways to do that is to make sure that we're getting in enough um, essential and non-essential amino acids. And I think, you know, it's just so important for people to understand you're not going to get this from pea protein. Um, you're not going to get it from hemp protein. You need to get this from some kind of animal source protein. Even dairy protein is, mm -hmm. is, is a really um, efficient way. And, you know, I see this having gone through um, chronic fatigue syndrome, that's what they called it years ago, mm -hmm. that was directly related to not getting in enough protein because the mitochondria eventually don't have the tools, they don't have the fuel to create energy, cellular energy. Uh, and you can supplement all you like. And I've tried this. Mm -hmm. All you end up doing is building up almost toxic levels of whatever you supplement. And B12 is a prime example. My, my ex-vegan clients, um, when they initially come in, we measure B12. And it's almost always too high because they've been supplementing. Because the body doesn't really know how to regulate the pathways, in a, in a, especially in a synthetic B12. So um, folic acid as opposed to folate, what's been made in a factory as opposed to food form and if you're not getting in your your meat source of b12 and you're taking it supplementally uh, eventually these levels build up to put to levels that are not healthy and you know the same goes for when you're trying to restore your mitochondria so there was a big deal about your know, mitochondrial restoration and mitochondrial health and you need to take x amount of supplements selenium and <laughs> yes. being one of them um, and these things are expensive and yes. they do nothing. They do nothing. Um, I, I think it's really anecdotal. I think you need to, you need again, get the, the, the basics, right? If you're eating a, the right amount of protein, the right amount of whole food carbohydrates and the right amount of healthy fats, and then you're getting your fiber and your nutrients from the vegetables four times a day, at least, if your energy levels don't improve, I'll be very surprised. I'll be right. very surprised. I mean, I can, I can completely say without hesitation that not eating animal protein drove me to what was called chronic fatigue or ME in those days. And yeah, that just getting that back in, you could literally feel the levels come back up. So yeah. Why do you, why do you mention um, the yes. mitochondrial? Mm. Oh, simply because um, there's, there's so many different conditions I feel like that are like kind of rooted in the mitochondria in and of themselves, um, as mm. you mentioned, chronic fatigue, but also for athletes, um, mm. for performance, the mitochondria are part of how you are able to perform, especially over a longer period of time. Like part of what we want to do is be able to build up more of those mitochondria in a cell so that you have yeah. the ability to be able to use fuel, um, mm. over a longer period of time. Um, mm. especially cause mm. I'm, I'm in a lot of the endurance world. So, yeah. um, that's the reason yeah. I, I mentioned it. And, and simply also because there are so many athletes that say like, my, as you mentioned, my energy went up, my performance got way better. Like all of my markers improved mm. when I started eating more protein and an adequate yeah. amount of protein for myself. Um, mm. Mm. both men and so the yeah. yeah, both men and women. Mm -hmm. Um, and the trick is what I've also found. This was a, a bodybuilding hack back in the day was to get the protein in before bed. So we don't yes. want to eat a big meal before bedtime, but our muscles are repairing and our brain is detoxifying while we're sleeping. And if we right. can give right. the mitochondria enough amino acids at night while we're sleeping in the form of something really digestible, so whey or casein, casein not for everybody, yeah. uh, so that we don't lose muscle mass while we're sleeping and those mitochondria are given food literally tools to do their job while we're you know at the at the best point where nature designed for us to heal and repair then you'll definitely see a change in energy and endurance it's, it's remarkable right. just yeah have a way shake before bedtime yes. um a quality way shake um yes. and it, it, it's amazing it's 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 almost stupid simple but it's right. because it's so simple it's overlooked and i think that's one of the biggest problems nowadays is we get complicated Yes, it's, it's really, we've got to get back to what nature intended and just keep it simple. Right.
I like how mm. you've also touched that it's not just about meat. It's not just about vegetables. It's about mm. all of the above, <laughs> the yeah. mix of both. They're all important. Um, mm. It's uh, I, I've heard actually, um, the other reason why I really was excited to do this podcast is because I had a, a close friend of mine say that she went um, recently to, to vegetarian vegan because um, she just was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And I had a really hard time with that because oh. as I just talked about how, um, or why I had you talk about the mitochondria, why I had you talk about some of those other pieces of how protein helps to support the cell mm. and detoxifying uh, our bodies. If you're going to mm. be going through chemo, if you're going to be going through radiation, really important to mm. have some of those layers that help to, mm. um, you know, keep the body yeah. moving and getting yeah. something about. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of the oncologists that I work with are really pushing their patients to get in enough protein, right. which I'm surprised and, and really amazed about because a couple of years ago, nobody mentioned that. But it yeah. is really important for, for recovery, especially if you're undergoing chemo. Yes, there are certain cancers that are L-glutamine sensitive, but it's very right. rare. Right. Um, but, I mean, if you're working with somebody who knows what they're doing, Yes. <laughs> like yourself, for example, you know, you know, right. uh, you know, eating oily fish every day is certainly not going to cause a problem. And it's going to go a long way to helping your body or your immune system, um, you know, go through what it has to, so you can heal right. really critically important. Right. Right. I got off on a little bit of a tangent there, but it's all important when it, when it comes to it. So, um, yeah. So the other reason also why I wanted to talk about, um, the the mitochondria is well just i think just protein um let's see i'm getting a little lost in my questions here um anyway i what i really wanted to 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 touch on now is um with protein mm -hmm. are there um some you mentioned some different ways to get in protein in many different formats um mm -hmm. what about things like bacon what about things mm -hmm. that are maybe a little bit higher on the fat side of things where yeah. what what do you think about that yeah. So again, it comes down to how that animal was raised. Um, uh, pigs, for example, who are pasture raised um, have different levels of saturated versus unsaturated fats. You want pig meat to have a lot of saturated fat in it. It's going to be a healthier meat. Um, there's it's probably one of the healthiest meats you can have, you can eat. So you get you find um, high levels of uh, stearic acid in, in pork. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what other vegetables you do, but stearic acid is a potent fat burner. So when you have enough stearic acid from the food you eat and you become more, your metabolism increases, you become more adept at, at actually burning fat. So uh, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, the healthiest breakfast out is bacon and eggs. You know, leave the cereals and the waffles and the orange juice because it's just yeah. pure fructose. And as the body makes fructose, our triglycerides are going to increase. And triglycerides are that together with elevated homocysteine is one of your benchmarks of heart disease. And you can go and measure your triglycerides <laughs> yes. um, today, have orange juice for a week and measure your triglycerides at the end of the week. Those triglycerides are going to increase because the, the liver makes triglycerides out of fructose. Right. But if you had to go and do the bacon and egg test and eat bacon and eggs, Every day, it's not going to do anything. It might even bring your triglycerides down because you're not going to eat the volume of food. You're going to be satisfied on far less um, than you would otherwise by eating sugar-laden breakfast foods. So yeah, the message has been completely skewed because there's much more profit to be made in a box of cereal than there is in bacon and eggs. But again, it's how the pig was raised. It's how the chickens were raised. That's crucial because what they ate becomes what we eat. It's not just the bacon that we're eating we eating what that pig ate its entire life and if it's been fed junk food cheap grains we're eating those cheap grains in the form of of, of meat so this is this is where we've got to be careful with protein or as right. consumers we've got to be really picky and we've yeah. got to go out there maybe eat less of it um but be more quality minded when it comes to our protein and as we, we do that manufacturers are going to be forced to change their manufacturing practice it's yes. just that's the way economy works is when we demand different they have to supply if you're yep. not buying what they're making they can't make it anymore and this is the power is in the consumer's you know pocket really 
Well, there's plenty more companies too that are becoming a little bit more accessible as far as getting that kind of meat into the hands of consumers. And for that matter, one of the great ways to support your local agricultural small farmer um, businesses and, and uh uh, is just to, to go to a local farmer, maybe grab a couple of friends and get a freezer in your, in your yeah. garage or whatever, and uh, stock it up with a bunch of different meat. And that's, that's one of the best ways to do that. That's it. You've got to think different. So instead still a of going differently. To, yeah. Just a bit differently. So instead of going to the supermarket is to get your friends together and say, well, let's go and support our local farmers. Yes. Which and is so important. <laughs> yeah. It oh, is. Yeah. And then at least you, I mean, the accountability in knowing where your food came from creates a totally different experience. Oh my gosh. I yes. Food. I have been raising my own meat chickens for the last three years now. I think. Um, so every year we buy a batch of just small little guys and they, they come, we raise them all and you watch them go across my front yard <laughs> and they just eat it up and they have a great time. And then when they're ready, we, we get them. Well, I have done the butchering process myself, which is, I think something that is um, an important Thing for people to see sometimes just to connect with their food and where it's really coming from um so mm -hmm. we've done that um but every once in a while when we don't have time we'll take them somewhere to to do mm -hmm. it for us but the process of it is when you see from start to finish where your meat comes from i mean i appreciate when i go to the freezer and grab those chickens like there's there's something so um hmm, it's it's a feeling that you know how you appreciate it i think a lot more um it's a, makes bit, me, there's a lot more respect for the future yeah, a lot more connected with what i'm eating which is uh, really important um but but to your point it is it, it especially when we're talking about eating more protein um that can go sideways if you're you know not getting a good enough quality of protein so yeah let's say somebody doesn't necessarily have a ton of access to um, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, protein. What mm -hmm. are some ways they can kind of structure their day that helps them at least get some um, and then maybe some other different types of protein to help balance that out a bit? Mm. So you can look at fish, um, you know, especially the small fish, things like sardines, uh, yes. whole caught tunas, yeah, it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be um, anything expensive. Fish is full of healthy oils. I think fish, getting used to eating fish as often as possible is really important. Um, obviously, the the discussion about organ meats is it's you know it's it's an edgy subject because not everybody likes the taste and texture oh. of organ meats. Yeah, but it is but you so critically important. <laughs> yes, you do. You do yeah. get used to it, and it's it's getting experimental in the kitchen. You know, uh, if you use enough flavor, garlic and herbs, and you can make anything taste good. But that organ meat is the cheapest, one of the cheapest forms of getting really incredible nutrition um mitochondrial boosting nutrition uh, right. just the just the just the um, nutrient profile in a chicken heart or a chicken liver is is second to nothing you can swallow in a capsule and you don't yeah. need a lot so that's really cheap way again it's got to be where it comes from but you know if you do find a source freeze it like you said just get a yes. freezer and keep everything in the freezer. You don't have to go shopping every day. So fish is one. Um, eggs, definitely. I'm a big fan of eggs. Eggs, mm. there's no evidence to show that eggs increase um, total cholesterol. Total cholesterol or even LDL cholesterol is not the monster that it was made out to be. I mean, we're learning that there's more evidence to prove that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then whey protein. Whey protein is the most misunderstood food. Uh, it was originally created as a, a found as a medical food. So somebody from a, from a supplement company was asked to go and create a medical food to pub feed people who were, be, who were paraplegic, who were bedridden, so that they wouldn't um, lose muscle because they couldn't move. Uh, so it was discovered, uh, these, these scientists went to a farm and figured out or found that, saw that these cows were looking really healthy and found out from the farmer, what are you feeding your cows? And he said, well, we're giving them back the whey because it's a waste, it's a waste product from the cheese making process. So oh. when you, when you make cheese, you take milk and you put in an enzyme, a separate, an enzyme called rennet into the milk, very basically, and you hang up this, this, this sort of 
thing of, of curdled milk and the water that comes out of there is whey. And that is where your L-glutamine is sitting. It's where most of your immunoglobulins are sitting and all of the amino acids are sitting in the whey. So what's left behind is the, is the casein, is the cheese, so the curds, and the water is the whey. And they were feeding this back to cattle, feeding back to pigs, to cows. And these pigs and cows started getting buff. They started getting muscles. And they started looking really healthy and getting shiny coats. And these guys said, well, let's try this. And they found as they fed this water, this whey water back to patients, it goes as far back as Hippocrates, where he called it a serum, a health serum way. Um, uh, they were finding these people weren't going into sarcopenia. So they weren't losing muscle mass. Uh, they were they were thriving rather than dying because their muscle mass was being preserved. Okay. So over the years, it's become a bodybuilding or an, a, a sort of a sports supplement because yes, it yeah. sustains yeah. muscle, which is what all sports people want to do, mm -hmm. but also it depends on who manufactures and what else they put in there. So you want to also make sure that your whey powder mm -hmm. is, is grass-fed, is you know as undenatured as possible. Uh, and that is not an expensive way to get your protein in. It works out cheaper than a tin of tuna per scoop of yeah. whey. Uh, so yeah, to buy a big canister of whey protein may look costly, but if you break it down to per meal, uh, a scoop of whey mixed up with water and a piece of fruit is a meal. You know, it'll get you through. Sure. Yeah. It does wonders. I swear by way. There's oh, so many I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, it, and that is one of the, the best hacks, I think, too. We didn't even touch on some of the benefits of protein for women in sports. Um, we didn't even go there, but there's the, I, I've definitely done that in many different other podcasts. Um, so if, if um, listeners are interested, you can definitely find information on that, mm -hmm. but whey protein in and of itself is so vital, um, for, mm -hmm. for, as you said, building protein, um, but also maintaining that muscle integrity and muscle mass. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think women are really scared of looking bulky and, you know, you know, whey protein or protein isn't going to give you testosterone. It isn't going to turn no. you into a man. No. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to make you ripped and lean. It's, right. not, it's not going to make you look like a guy. I don't know where right. this myth came from because maybe female bodybuilders who take steroids look a certain way and we all assume well that's the protein they're eating no it's not the protein it's the artificial stuff they're injecting which is also giving them a deep voice right um so no don't get confused the protein is what keeps you young it's really good for your skin i mean people are so into their collagen protein but you make collagen from amino acids so yeah. it doesn't have to be collagen you can i still think whey is the is this absolute superfood and it's so underappreciated because yeah. I know yeah. what it does for me. I mean, I, I I gave it to my my daughter when she was born because um, yeah. I couldn't breastfeed because of my oh. thyroid. So okay. I didn't make, I just couldn't. It was mm. just there was nothing there. So I created a formula out of whey and other things for her. But mm -hmm. I, she thrived on whey protein, oh. and she still does. So I swear by the stuff. And it is, it's food. It comes from milk. Yeah. It's you know, it's not like some concoction that was not like um, <laughs> artificial meat that's been created in a lab that now looks like a burger. Right. People are happy to eat that, but they oh. won't go eat cheese. For goodness' sake! Come I on, I know. Let's get real. We're yeah. all over the place Crazy. when it comes to nutritionism. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and so <clears throat> is there, is there anything else that you'd like to, to, to cover that we didn't today? Um, just last, I think we've covered a lot, but we I did. think just to go back to basics is yeah. that we need to go back to basics that you need to eat everything. And I, right. I'm, you know, I'm really against the words moderation because what's moderate for an athlete and what's moderate for say mm -hmm. a person of 65 is different. Um, but we need to eat everything. We need to eat protein. We need to eat whole food carbs. And what I mean by whole food carbs is nothing that comes in a box. So if it has, if it's gone through a factory process and it has a list of ingredients, that is not even a, that's not even a carbohydrate. That's a Franken food. I think Mark mm -hmm. Harmon calls them Franken foods. Mm -hmm. yep. And we need healthy fats. So we need, and we need our vegetables. So we need a little bit of everything several times a day with your water, just plain water. And that's the basis for general good health. And then your that's the tools your body needs to fix most problems. You know, uh, it's, it's the tools your immune system needs to be robust. It's the tools that your endocrine system need to to age you healthily. It's you know, it's 
it's everything. And it, it's not going to come in a fad diet. It's not going to come in a box. It's not going to come on the internet. It is back to basics. And if we can just forget all the fads, you're going to be so much better off. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I say, I talk a lot about nutrient deficiencies and athletes on a lot of podcasts. And I always mm -hmm. say that your nutrition is the foundation of everything that happens in your body. You have to get in good nutrition, mm -hmm. um, really good sources of vitamins and minerals and amino acids and fatty acids. All of those things come from food and your body yeah. knows how to do all of the things. <laughs> like it knows exactly. what it needs. It knows what it wants and it will automatically pull from food what it needs and get really rid of the rest. So yeah. it's a yeah. really cool thing. Yeah. Look, supplementing is fine, but that yeah. is a supplement to an already healthy diet. Right. You know, if you don't have the basics, you can take all these expensive supplements, Jack, it's not going to work right. as well as getting the basics right. So those are an addendum um, to something that's already established and it's in place. Absolutely. Well, where can people find you? Do you have things going on that you'd like to talk about your podcast? Um, please tell us where yeah. people can find you and what you're up to. So my website is probably the best place. That's reinventhealth.ca. Um, I do consult to clients all over the world. It's thanks to COVID, it's become quite prolific. So that's, yep. this is really cool. Got a lot of American clients nowadays, yeah. um, which is really great because it's really interesting to see how, you know, we're all the same, no matter what country we live in, everyone's experiencing the same issues. We all have right. the same, it's, we're all the same and we're all having to deal with the same issues um, as far as health is concerned. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really interesting. The podcast is the reinvent health podcast. It's available everywhere on all, all platforms. And yeah, that's going into its 52nd or 53rd episode now, which is amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, everything's on the website. So if anyone wants to ask questions or get in contact, um, it's the best place to start. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. It was so great to have you with us today. Oh, thank you. This was amazing. Okay. And thank you to everybody for watching. We're so excited that you joined us today. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out, um, drop a comment below and we'll be back with another episode soon. All right. Well, take care.